since I have been using the build the arc hashtag and since things have arrived at the place that they were destined to arrive, I have been getting a lot more communication from people and a lot more messages from people now in this moment asking for more information on what does this mean, this term build the arc. And specifically, there are quite a few people who are asking, do you have some sort of video or writing or something where I can know the exact things that I need to do in order to build the arc? And I have noticed that these questions are not coming from the brothers and sisters who I speak to regularly about more spiritual matters particularly Christian and particularly individuals who I would say are a little more traditional Christian, so Orthodox or traditional Catholic, even some uh, Protestants who are of liturgical traditions and who are heavily involved in the church and uh, read the scripture and understand the symbolism. I think it's very important at this moment to be able to communicate to individuals who that might not be the case and I think I'm in a unique position in the particular community that I've been a part of that I'm able to maybe bridge some things. So I would like to talk about as best I can what build the arc means in a way that is not overtly religious, but draws upon the wisdom that has been certainly elaborated on in the time since orthodoxy has found me and since I've been accepted into the church and since I've taken on the practice. These are things that I have learned in the time that I have been pursuing many different spiritual practices. I know that there are some people within the communities that I have been a part of who have even explicitly told me, explicitly, uh, people who I actually have a lot of respect for in terms of being able to do the concrete things to prepare oneself if things get bad or even if they don't. These individuals have specifically said to me in the past, the second you bring up the Bible, you've lost me. I'm done. So I'm going to try to bridge that gap because I think it is crucially important to do so. So I wanna talk about two things then. And the first thing is what is the problem? The big problem that requires building the ark and what is the big impediment to building the ark? And then second, I want to talk about what is the ark? And hopefully when we have those two things combined, it might even shed some light to a few people on why I have chosen to adopt orthodoxy as a practice, orthodox Christianity, and why the adoption of that practice has allowed me and many others to see what was coming. Now I saw it maybe, you know, a year, two years, some might say three in a very foggy way. I will tell you, and if you want to go and, and hear this explained much better by a uh, doctor of theology and Orthodox priest, Father Peter Hears, his Orthodox Ethos podcast, you can find it on YouTube. There's a video he recently did, last week he did it, called Why I Will Not Be Inoculated and he goes through a litany, a literal litany of modern Orthodox fathers who saw this exact moment coming. I mean, literally down to uh, a vaccine, a faked disease and a vaccine, and who saw it coming decades ago. So some idea about the span of time and the answer to where do I find the information on how to build the ark? So let me first talk about what the problem is, the big problem. And this is a quintessential human problem. This is a known problem in f political philosophy 
in particular. It's often referred to as Hume's guillotine, after Hume the philosopher, or the Oz, the ought is problem. So even those people who are atheists, who are perhaps new atheists, who follow that group of individuals, uh, will have heard of this ought is problem. And basically what Hume said is, you cannot derive an ought from an is. And what he meant was, no matter how much information you are given, sort of quantitative information about a particular subject, uh, about a particular event, it does not, there is a gap between having that information and knowing what to do with that information. So the is is the information, the ought is what is to be done, what should I do? And the fact of the matter is, even as we look at the situation as it stands today, we've, many people are getting the same information and people given the same information are making decisions to do completely opposite things. Even some things to where one party says the other party is crazy, even though they're looking at the same information. And so you could see from this that simply acquiring more information and in general, if we're going out to acquire more information, it will be more information that supports our side or we believe supports our side. And then giving it to someone who has a different ought, who has decided to take a different action given the information that they have, more often than not, will not sway them. Why? Because as Hume said, you cannot derive an ought from an is. Giving them more is does not help them to develop an ought. So how do we develop our oughts? Where do these oughts come from? How do we decide what we should do with information? Well, quite simply, we adopt an ideology. And if we do not consciously choose an ideology, one will be chosen for us because they are just sitting right there in our culture. They will come from our parents. They will come from our friends. How do we react in a certain situation? What do we do on Sunday morning? Is it church? Is it football? They're both available. Or is it go on a hike? Or is it sleep in and sleep off the hangover? What is it? What ought I to do with my Sunday morning? We adopt some ideology. And if we do not consciously adopt an ideology, one will be adopted for us. Jordan Peterson introduced into the common lexicon the term ideologically possessed. And I've adopted it, I think it's fantastic. But one of the things he said, the first time I heard him use the term is he said, you can always tell someone who is ideologically possessed because you know what they're going to say next. You always know exactly what they're going to say next. It's almost like you don't even need to have a conversation with them because they are just a conduit for something else. Now, the memes have come up and said that this is an NPC. Okay. It's a non-player character or a non-playable character, meaning that it lacks agency. But something is moving it. Something is determining its ought. Now to the ancients, they didn't have the word ideology. They didn't have uh, academic sociology. They didn't have psychology, but they had something much more effective and it lasted a lot longer. They saw what motivates inside of us and what gives us our oughts as spirits. External consciousnesses, which is, makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? When we see the meme of all of the NPCs standing there, right? And they all have, they all say the one voice. Well, from where do those words come? It can't be from inside any one of those NPCs. Right? It must come from some program above them, moving through them. 
And a very good way to visualize that is to say that it is some other entity. And if we look at what these NPCs do, if we look at what someone who is ideologically possessed does and how they behave, manifested in them, in their face, as it changes when they become triggered, in their reaction to certain stimuli, what we start to actually see is we start to see the personality of the programmer, the personality of the entity behind them. And when we see enough examples, we can start to get a very good idea of what is this entity that has taken possession of them. And now the interesting thing about the situation that we're in now, I've used the term zombies. You know, we use the term woke, which is great. The woking dead, right? <laughs> but it's also this sort of inversion of the individual who is hypnotized and is asleep, but is being told by the hypnotist that they are awake. We see this happening and there is an entity there. There is an entity at work. And this entity must be very powerful because it is taking over the waking consciousness and the every piece of these people's lives to the point where the president of the United States in his announcement that a hurricane is coming and declaring a national uh, emergency so that FEMA can act in these areas, the first advice that he gives is go and get the woke poke for a hurricane. There is something possessing. It is delivering an ought. And now if you want to reverse this, as you can see, charts, graphs, logic, information, these are is. These are is. You can't derive an ought from an is. The more is's you throw at them, it doesn't matter. This is an all-encompassing spirit. This is an all-encompassing program. It can handle anything that you throw at it and it turns it only back that they ought to do whatever this entity wants them to do. The classic picture that was then used in, of course, the, the cartoons that I grew up with, the angel on one shoulder and the demon on the other. The person is going to do one or the other, aren't they? And these spirits battle it out. They battle it out for control of the individual. And this is the spiritual understanding. This is the understanding that is in, that is crucially a part of Christianity and is the ancient belief that there are spirits and there are big and powerful ones and little ones. What are some little ones? Some little ones that we might not call ideologies, but will possess aspects of individuals' lives and are more powerful in certain places than others. Little gods, local gods, not big gods, local gods. The Greeks might have a local god, the god of your village. Or the, the, on the positive side, the Slava of, of a family, like the family's patron saint in Orthodox Christianity, it's called the Slava. You might have this aura of a village. And think about what we have. Think about somebody that you see who's got sports teams in their bio, right? Go to New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Go into a bar, many bars, just a local neighborhood bar, and sit at the bar and listen to the conversation of the men. You'll be uh, hard-pressed to hear anything other than discussion of the Celtics, the Patriots, the Bruins, the Red Sox, depending on the season, of course. Little God. The God of, the God of Boston sports, the God of New England sports who sits on their mantle, 
who they'll get dressed up into the garb and go and, and celebrate on the particular festival days. And when the Patriots win a Super Bowl, that whole thing, like nowhere else, and how that God, that little God, manifests itself. The ancients understood this. And so then there's an ought. What ought I to do as a person in Boston? When there's a Red Sox game, I stop, I watch. I join with friends. On a Sunday, what do I do? I, I ought to put on the jersey of this, the, my, my little God, my local God, and celebrate. And sit with friends and eat and feast. It's a feast day. We have all of these. We call them by different things. We're locked in materialism and it doesn't allow us to see. And so what we want to do is we, we want to change the ought. Or at least we want some degree of protection so that we ourselves are not possessed by this God. And it's a big one. This is not a little one. The one that's possessing now is like something we, you've never seen. We've, we've never seen this in modern times. It's global. It's all-encompassing. And it's vicious. They've begun to say the God inside of them has begun to say, I want those who are not possessed by me dead. I want them dead. Their sickness. They're carrying pathogens. They're killing us. We must kill them. We must remove them from our society. And this manifests and they do it with a smile. People who wouldn't have thought this, this would have been the farthest thing from them in terms of what ought I to do? If you would have asked them, is this an appropriate thing for some society to do three years ago? Would you ever have done this three years ago? They would have said no because they were not possessed. But once they were possessed, it's no longer in their control. And so what is the answer? Well, you cannot. You're going to make a decision. The devil, the angel on the shoulder. There's no third decision. You're going to do one or the other. That's the thing, isn't it? Do this. No, do this. Ah, you're fighting between the two. There isn't, screw both of you guys. I'm doing whatever I want to do. That's not, that's not how it works. That's not how the symbolism works. That's not how our consciousness works. That's not how spiritual warfare works. And so what do you have to do? You need to find a spirit that is not a spirit of death, that is a spirit of life. That is not just some local spirit. That is a universal spirit that is a gigantic spirit that can infuse your whole being and the being of everything around you. And that if it did that to the same degree that this infernal spirit that is that has moved in, this ideology that has moved into the soul of these individuals in the same way that that is destroying economies, destroying people's health, destroying families, making, making everything worse, that there is a spirit that will make everything better. And that is the spirit that has to go to battle. That is the spirit that has to take over, to clear out the other spirit and to put itself inside. Because when individuals are filled with that spirit, that ideology, that pattern, that program, whatever you need, materialists, whatever you need, of course, it's much easier if we'll just do it in the way that the ancients have been doing it. There's a reason why it's stuck, because it worked to explain the world. But if you need it in another way, call it whatever you want. Call it a pattern. Call it a program. It needs to replace what's there. But that's not going to happen right now. This is not going to stop. And so that spirit does exist. 
and now the materialist and the atheist will cringe when I call it the Holy Spirit, but let me just use that as a shorthand. As a shorthand for the way of life. Which is what this was called, by the way, by early Christians. I was just actually a, a Russian priest who's been adding some additional catechism to my life and to the life of some people, to the people around me, who's very adept at teaching about the ancient faith, um, introduced us to what was the first Christian catechism. It's called Didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. You can look it up. It was lost for a while and then came back. And as the church teaches that this was basically what was taught to the early Christians. It's very short. It's maybe 10 to 12 pages. But the first doctrine that they teach is that there are two ways. This is original Christianity. There are two ways. The way of life and the way of death. And what you're being catechized into, what you're being brought up in, is the way of life, the pattern of life. That's what it was meant to be. All of it's been lost in telephone, people grabbing for power and all of this, but now we need it back. And that is the Holy Spirit, the holy program, the program of life. And so what is the ark? The ark, the ark is the container that allows the program of life, the Holy Spirit, to move through time and place. Time and space. So there have been, there's echoes of the ark throughout the scriptures. So obviously the first ark is Noah's ark. And it's a giant container. And what goes inside? Life. Every form of life. Two by two. And then there's the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the Israelites, as they leave from out of Egypt, Moses receives this information about building the Ark of the Covenant, very specifically. And it goes in front of the people. And what is inside? The Holy Spirit is inside the life of the people, and the people follow it. It protects and keeps the people, just as Noah's Ark protected and kept Noah and his family. And then there is the echo that goes to the temple built by Solomon, but that the Lord told to David that it would be built. David was concerned because King David, because he had managed to conquer and they were no longer a nomadic people and here the ark of the covenant which still remained was living in a tent and he wanted to build it a house because david said to the lord that the lord had built him a house palace david already had a palace that he had given him the kingship and a, a palace and a, a home a permanent home and he wanted to give that to the holy spirit and, and the Lord didn't allow him to do that because he had so much blood on his hands. But he allowed his son, Solomon, to do it. And then there is a virgin, Mary, who is told that she will be the new ark, that she will be the container for the Holy Spirit, which will incarnate of her, and itself, and will become a man, Jesus Christ, who will be the Holy Spirit manifested on earth. And then, after Christ's death and resurrection, then the Holy Spirit became, the, the ark became the church, and the Holy Spirit was breathed into the apostles, and the apostles have carried that on. And this is the echo that it's the idea that at all times there needs to be some container by which the Holy Spirit can move through time and space. But that that ark, because the Holy Spirit, because it is a container of the Holy Spirit, so long as the ark is built 
according to what the Holy Spirit says it should be built as, then it protects the people. It protects the people. And so the Holy Spirit is there. But every soul, every individual that the, this other program gets into that is possessed is no longer space for the Holy Spirit, is no longer space for the way of life. It's pursuing the way of death. And so the first thing to build the ark, the echo is told to us. So people ask, where does the information about how to build the ark come from? And then when I say, well, the information comes from the Holy Spirit, it's interesting that these same people will say to me, oh, well, I don't, that doesn't sound like, that's just, I don't know what that even means. It sounds very vague. They don't say that to me when I tell them that, when I would ask ayahuasca shamans, well, where did you learn? Or, or how did the uh, original shamans learn how to cook the very particular brew in the particular way to mix these two particular plants in order to get this brew that gives you this earth-shattering experience. And they said, well, the spirit of ayahuasca taught us how to do it. And those same people who will say to me, oh, this is very, that sounds very vague when you say the Holy Spirit. On that, they'll be like, oh, that sounds so interesting. Maybe, uh, maybe I should go and, I'm thinking that maybe I should do some ayahuasca. Yeah, because spirits are the ought. Spirits tell us what to do with the, the world around us. And the Holy Spirit is a real deal. There's a, it's, you wouldn't have a system that lasts 2,000 years where people have been willing to die over and over and over again for it if they were not direct experiencers of this phenomenon. And so Noah was told how to build the ark. By whom? By the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. Moses well, what's important about Noah? What does it say about Noah? He was perfect in his generations, purified. Moses goes up onto the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. What's he doing? Self-purification, fasting. 40, the 40 days and 40 nights is a reference to a fast. Spiritual purification, purification of himself. And then the Lord speaks to him through the Holy Spirit and gives him the instructions on how to build the ark, amongst many other things. David. David is not allowed to build the temple. Why? He's got blood on his hands. He's not pure. Solomon is allowed. It's the same pattern. Nathan comes, the prophet of David, and tells David the story that the Lord, the Lord has said that his son and his, his generations will build the temple. So we have a physical temple built, but then we also have the generations of David, which Mary is a part of. And she is the temple. And what is it about her? A virgin, purified, pure. The vessel needs to be pure. The Holy Spirit needs a, p a pure vessel to be a part of. And the church as well, the purification this is the practice. And so the instructions for how to build the ark are there. If you will be willing to purify yourself and to be a proper vessel for the Holy Spirit, and then you are the beginning of the ark. And then what you build will carry through space and time. And it's not just you. Because in the same way that the NPCs are united by the spirit that possesses them, we are united by the Holy Spirit that abides and lives in us. That is what unites us. So then you won't be alone. This is what it means to build the ark. This is the place to start. <laughs>